everyone. Yeah, this is so special. I haven't been a part of the actual the, the actual Shabbat service before doing a cooking demo before. So it's nice to be in community with you all tonight. And I'm so excited to share this recipe. So um, I know we just did a prayer about bread and I'm so excited to share hummus, which is the classic Iraqi bread. And I was talking to someone on your team who has Yemenite um, family and was saying that that's also the same name that they have for bread that they cook. So it's actually just an Arabic word that means bread. And the traditional Iraqi bread is called hummus tanur, which is um, just it, uh, indicating what oven it's cooked in. So tanurs are these uh, big clay ovens that are sort of in a, in a dome shape and you have super hot on the inside and you actually slap the dough on the inside of the oven. So it's getting the direct heat um, and also ambient heat in there. Um, I don't have one of those today. So I'm going to make hubba's tawa. And tawa just um, is a word to mean fried, essentially. And I sort of came up with this trying to make this bread at home, but have since learned that this is actually a really common way of trying to cook this bread at home. Um, and so I end up using, this is a carbon steel wok. Um, you can also use a cast iron pan, um, but I like the wok because it has that similar dome shape so it can make a nice big piece of, of bread. And so I'll be walking through that um, in, in a bit once we have the dough ready. Um, and, you know, this bread is something that I can't say I, I grew up eating in the same way that my family did because there obviously aren't bakeries on every corner that sell this, but in Baghdad where my dad grew up, um, you would never have bread from over a day. You would always have fresh bread that was from the bakery down the street. And it was an essential part of almost every meal. In fact, traditionally, a lot of people don't use utensils, but actually use the bread as a vehicle to eat the food. Um, and, um, and so I didn't have the direct experience necessarily of having that bread fresh from the bakery, but I heard so many stories about it. And there's many... Um, different ways that my family tried to get this bread. So there's a famous story of a family member going to a pizza, um, a pizza spot in New York and asking for a full, you know, like eight pizzas, but without any toppings. Um, because pizza dough is, you know, cooked in a wood fire oven is actually very similar to Chobiz, Chobiz Tenor. So um, they thought that was very strange, but it was very successful with the family. And, um, you know, non bread is a very similar type of bread. And so that has been very popular amongst my family, but it's been very exciting for me and meaningful for me to try to recreate this recipe as closely as possible and share it with family and community. So with that, I will get started with the recipe. And um, I know you guys don't have the written recipe, um, but you will be getting sent that in a couple of days. So you can make this on your own at home. And the recipe I sent out was for about four to five large pieces of bread um, and I'm going to be making um, a half batch of that and so because it had to rise I pre-made some bread and that's what I'll be using to actually cook but I did want to show you the steps um, about making the dough so I have a mixing bowl here um, and anyone who's made any kind of dough um, especially bread dough it's very similar and I would say it's almost exactly the same as making pizza dough so there's no real, I mean, I have a couple of tricks I'll, I'll share with you, but there's nothing particularly unusual about the way to make the dough. But for people who are maybe a little bit more um, new to this, I'm going to, it uses a lot of flour. Um, so I'm gonna do about two cups of flour. Is this any, any flour in the marketplace you use? Um, so yeah, I think bread flour would work well because uh, bread, bread flour has a higher gluten content, so it'll be extra stretchy, but I'm pretty, um, I'm pretty basic about the flour I use. Right now I'm using King Arthur. I love King Arthur. It's, it's, a, it's a nice company and they make really high quality flour and this is just all purpose flour. Um, you can mix in um, some whole wheat flour or use bread flour. Um, if you do use whole wheat flour, I would recommend adding a little bit more water. Um, but I do think, you know, more traditionally, if you go back far enough, most bread was whole wheat. They didn't have necessarily the technology to haul off the, the bran. And so um, it is something that's nice to, to 
try to do, but I would say because of the whole wheat flour that's available, it's important to have at least some all-purpose flour in the mixture. So I would actually only do a quarter of the flour as whole wheat flour, um, maybe half. Um, so then I'm going to add um, half a tablespoon of salt. Now I see the box you have kosher salt. This yeah, I was wondering if you were gonna <laughs> mention that, but yeah, I, you know, it's funny, kosher salt's great. Not only is it kosher, um, gotta represent, but um, it is the choice salt in the restaurant industry um, because it's um, it's very consistent, kosher salt, different brands that you get, and it's, it's good quality um, salt, and it has like large enough grains that it can be, you know, it's a really nice addition, it has a little texture, but, um, and it's not iodized, so it doesn't have that flavor. Um, so have a teaspoon of yeast. And um, an added trick that I've worked with more recently around making doughs is adding some baking powder. I'm adding a quarter teaspoon of baking powder. And that might help a little bit with the rise, but it's also, it helps dough stay soft. Um, as you're cooking it. So would you recommend, it, I'm, so, I'm sorry, would you recommend like Fleischmann's yeast or any of those high acting yeast like Red Star or? Oh yeah, based? so I use, I use rapid acting yeast. I use, um, what is the, what is the word? Um, fast acting. Rapid rise. Rapid rise, yeah. Cause the thing about this bread is I'm really not gonna, I tend to not let it rise that, that long. And I think about it, I think about it in terms of this fast paced bakery culture, um, like the machbas, which is the word for um, bakery or baker, and that actually has the same root as bread. Um, and they're rapidly going through, I mean, they're, ch they're churning out like thousands of pieces of bread a day. And so I have to imagine, you know, they have it timed quickly, but I, I think this dough is really not supposed to rise super long. Um, it's not a very slow, it's a much more fast paced, bread than this like big loaf of sourdough or something like that and so um yeah i use the fast yeast if you have if you have um a slower yeast then you can activate it ahead of time you activate yeast you put a little sugar in a bowl of some water and mix the yeast in and leave it for five to ten minutes um and once you start to see bubbles you know the yeast is activated but i'm just mixing it into the dough and i don't need the sugar because the flour will work as the sugar for for the yeast um and the yeast will be activated over the time that the that the dough gets to rise so that's just salt yeast baking powder and flour and then i'm going to get warm water ready so i use warm water not boiling water but the warm water does help the yeast get activated a little faster and it helps the dough stick together and I'm assuming the warm wa wa warm water, like in your winter time, helps accelerate it too in the cold weather. Yeah, it's true. So it's like it's it's bringing the whole temperature of the mixture mm -hmm. up because um, as you're letting it rise, you're basically waiting for the yeast to wake up. Yeast is a living thing. You're waiting for it to to essentially wake up. It's been in this dry place for a long time, and then eat the start to eat the sugars of the of the flour and create air bubbles. So you'll notice I'm adding the water very slowly um, because I don't want to add too much water. Um, and that's the biggest risk you can run. It's much harder to um, work with a dough that has too much water added to it than not enough. Like if it's not enough, I just add another drop. But if you add too much, you add more flour, but I don't know. It's it's hard to it's hard to backtrack. So I go very slowly and I mix it up a lot. And I'm actually using a rice paddle. I really like to use that to mix the dough. And then I'll end up using my hands in a minute. So what's the consistency consistency of it right now? It looks a little thick or or chunky. Yeah, it's like flaky, chunky. Um, so it's definitely still dry, but it's gonna start to come together because there's water inside each chunk that as I'm mixing it is being released. And this is based on the adage, it's better to a little bit than too much because you can't go back the other way, right? <laughs> is that an actual adage? 
That's what I always heard. Don't add too much because you can't go back. Yeah, I love that. So it's, it's starting to come together. I'm going to start using my hands. Also working with your hands in dough. I know that there's there's research out there. So my other work is in, in growing food. And there's, there's research out there that says touching soil. Um, they like releases endorphins, like the bacteria in soil coming in contact with your hands somehow releases endorphins in your body. And so you are happier, you know, soil. I also feel like there must be something true about that and, and, and working with dough because I find it very meditative and grounding. Um, and I love this recipe because I think people can get really intimidated about making bread, but flatbread is such an approachable way of having bread in the house, having fresh bread in the house is, is really, you know, I think the way that our food system works is it's, it's harder to get fresh bread. Um, and so making it yourself, especially in times of quarantine is, is, is so special. So it's definitely a little sticky, but this is really nice. I think actually the dough I made before is a little on the wet side, um, but it should be fine. Um, if it is a little on the wet side, you can always add a tiny bit. Like I might add a tiny bit of flour, but you'll notice I'm, I'm kneading it. I'm just pressing it down and then, and then folding it over and pressing it down. And you want to knead it for a while. Um, that's going to activate the gluten in the flour. And it's just going to make it more stretchy when we're shaping it later. And in the same way that you shape a pizza dough, you want to be able to shape this flatbread without it ripping. So you got to I got a yeah. question for Annabelle. I sure. see, I think that the plastic bowl, does it make a difference between a plastic bowl, maybe a metal bowl, and maybe even so a wood bowl, which is very traditional to a lot of Ashkenazi families? Interesting. I, I didn't know about wooden bowls and that connection. Um, so but a metal I, one may have metallic. Uh, uh, yeah. I, honestly, I have been it, not discriminating with the bowl I use, though I do tend towards these plastic bowls. I just find them easy to work with. Um, I also, I have some bowls that have a lid on them. Like they, they, they almost like a giant Tupperware and that's nice for letting dough rise because you can like put the lid on lightly. Um, I think wooden bowls would definitely be hard to clean. Um, I wonder if it'd be interesting, anyone who uses like collects their, you know, for sourdough, you can collect wild yeast or something. Wood, wood seems like it, it holds it holds bacteria and stuff like that um, more than plastic or metal. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. It also has like healthy um, cultures that it holds in it. And so that's the benefit of using wood for some things. But I like, I like the plastic personally, but I can't speak to um, why specifically. Um, and metal, yeah, I'm just worried about the like metallic flavor maybe rubbing off, but I haven't had trouble. I haven't noticed any difference using different kinds of bowls. Can't say I've used a wood bowl though. All right, I'm getting there. It's gonna start being smooth. And then it's a little sticky, but I think that that's good. You don't want it to be too dry. Um, and so I'm gonna put a nice bowl. Um, some people say put a, use a clean bowl, but I might add a tiny bit of, um, of oil to the bottom. And that might just help it also not stick as much when, when we're cooking it later. As a point of reference, any type of oil or any kitchen oil? Um, so once again, I don't really, I don't, um, okay. I don't have a specific preference. I used olive oil, it's gonna add a nice flavor. Um, I think that people think of, you know, the Mediterranean area and olive oil being a really key ingredient in a lot of that food. I will say Iraq is, you know, it is definitely an impacted by that. Um, but I, I learned recently, so olive oil is the oil that we use for a lot of our food. Um, but Iraq isn't a Mediterranean country, fundamentally. It's not on the sea. Um, it's a river, desert climate. Um, and there aren't really olives growing there. Um, it is definitely close to places that grow olives, but um, I learned that, you know, so um, among a lot of Iraqis, um, the um, typical fat is ghee, clarified butter. It is the typical fat used in cooking, but of course Jews for kosher reasons traditionally didn't use ghee and um, ses refined sesame oil, not like the kind that you would get in East Asian 
um, grocery store that has a strong sesame flavor, where fine sesame oil often tastes a lot like grapeseed or, or even canola vegetable oil, um, was the typical oil. And people said you could know a Jewish household in Iraq by the smell of the sesame oil, which was distinctive. Um, and so I have been trying to cook more with sesame oil. It feels, it's like slightly harder to get, but a lot of grocery stores sell it. Um, and I feel like the sesame oil that's sold now is more refined. You can't even really test the sesame, but it is, a, it's a nice oil. Um, I like it more than, it feels a little less heavy than canola oil. And I like to think it adds a little bit of sesame flavor, but um, sesame seeds and sesame oil were um, the original oil. So if you have sesame oil, that's probably, <laughs> Um, the best use, but olive oil is great. It's going to add a great flavor and any oil really will be good. Not so, any particular brand. No. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, I do my, you know, my family is lucky um, uh, to have a, a family friend who's from Lebanon and we get large volumes of, um, of olive oil from, they, they actually have an olive oil, you know, company and farm in Lebanon. And so we have that sort of hookup. Um, but I do love getting big jugs of, of olive oil at, um, you know, Middle Eastern grocery stores. Um, it's sort of a good trade off of quality versus like getting it in bulk. Um, so this is ready um, to sit and you want it to sit for a while. Um, so a lot of the time I'll actually make the dough a day in advance and put it in the fridge um, overnight. And so that gives it plenty of time to really develop um, and the yeast to, to activate and create air bubbles in the dough. You just wanna make sure it comes up to room temperature. So that can often take like 30 minutes or more um, before you cook it. Um, alternatively, about an hour is a good um, time to let it sit, but 30 minutes is totally fine. And, and the thing is, it's not really gonna make that much of a difference in the same way it would with a loaf of dough. It's, it's going to determine how many air bubbles are formed um, when you when you start to heat it up. And so it's a little bit more of, it's a little bit more forgiving, I would say, than other breads, the rice. Like, like challah, sometimes when you leave the dough in the refrigerator, you may cover it with a, a wet um, wet uh, table, uh, wet napkin or something. Is that necessary for this type of bread to yeah, cover it? So a wet tablecloth is good. I'm honestly also like, we'll just put a plate on it. You kind of want to hold the moisture in. Um, by putting a little oil on it, I'm also hoping to hold the moisture in a little bit. Um, so wet paper towel definitely keeps the moisture in. Um, I just feel like it's plenty humid here. I'm not as worried about that. Um, so I just put a plate on top to keep it kind of sealed more or less. Um, and so I'll let that sit for a while. So this hasn't necessarily been sitting for the longest period of time, but it's gotten quite a deal bigger. Um, and um, been about 40 minutes or so. You said 40 minutes? Okay. Yeah. Again, folks, we're going to have this on the website in a couple of days so you can have a nice contest at home. Um, so we have our dough, and I think I mentioned this earlier, Chuba's tanur is traditionally in very large pieces. So, I mean, that expression, those who break bread together, it's quite literally something that you'll tear apart and share with people. Um, so that's why I like to use this pan. Um, and so I'm actually, so this is two cups of flour. Um, it's about a cup of flour per piece. And so I'm going to, um, and basically you can use a bread, a bread um, cutter or a knife um, and divide it into two equal pieces and then shape them into a ball so you can sort of use your hand. So this is gonna be a pretty big piece. If you want them to be smaller, you know, more like personal size pieces, you can just cut it into more pieces. So think about it as like more of a half a cup or three quarters of a cup of, of flour per, per piece. What's a big piece in diameter? Six inches, 12 guess, inches? And does that match? Out. And does, I'm sorry, and does that match the, and how, how wide is the pen uh, to your right? Um, so I, I will, I think that the best way of answering that question is, is, is showing you once. Okay. I would say these are on the bigger side. They could definitely be bigger, but they're pretty big. They're as big as like my hand can roll. So that's my limit. <laughs> um, so 
This pan is quite large. I'll hold it up again. I mean, this pan was not meant for this. So as you can see, there used to be like a wooden handle on this side and it, it, it eventually <laughs> burned off um, from, from me using this. I probably should try to move these. Um, but I get these pans specifically for this purpose. And, and carbon steel is great. Um, I use this all the time for cooking. Not I use both sides of it for cooking. Um, but um, it starts out as silver. It comes, when you buy it, it's silver. And then quickly as you start to use it, it blackens um, as you're cooking on it. Um, and so it sort of has a cast iron type of, like you use it sort of like a cast iron, but because it's so, it's so thin, because you know carbon steel is able to be more malleable that way. So um, it doesn't take quite as long to heat up as, as cast iron would. If you are using a cast iron pan, um, it's just sort of on high heat. Um, um, and you can just use it right side up. I've never really tried flipping it over. It seems like the shape that they come in would be a little more challenging. Um, but the shape of this, what I'm going to do, so yeah, so it's very big. I think you can see, um, I don't know the exact diameter, but maybe the large pieces of bread are like 10 inches, nine to 10 inches um, across this big. Yeah, you said it was like a personal pizza side. So I think we can envision that. So, um, oops. Um, so I'm gonna start, so let me try orienting towards the stove. I wanna try to have like a little bit of both. So I start by heating it right side up and then I'm gonna flip it once it starts to actually, so this is sort of counterintuitive to a lot of, I guess it's like searing a steak or something like that, but um, you really want it on super high heat because you're thinking these hot clay ovens, like a wood fired oven they get a lot hotter than um, than just frying on a pan. So super hot, and once that starts to really clearly emit heat, I'll flip it over. Um, so while that's heating up, I'll, I'll show you here. So I'm just sort of flattening this with my hands. Um, and then I really just shape it with my hands, uh, but there's a method I'm just kind of throwing it. I'm sort of, I'm, how do I describe this? I'm, I'm holding onto the edge and I'm sort of twirling it around like this, um, but I'm throwing it between my hands so that um, the momentum is sort of stretching it out a little bit. And so it's a lot like pizza. If you have any skills, I mean, I know pizza dough, um, you know, people who worked in a pizza place, they use their knuckles a bit. I try not to roll it out as much. Um, as pizza dough, because I really want the bubbles. The bubbles are part of the appeal. Um, so I'm sort of stretching, and unlike pizza dough, you don't need the thicker edge in the same way. So this pan's smoking. I don't know if you can really see it. But I'm what does it feel like? Is it is it supposed to be rubbery or um, or what's what's the feeling? You, you're, give us an idea of what it's it feels like. It's stretchy. Um, I'm trying to be somewhat gentle with it. I don't want to I don't want to pull it too thin in any spot. But part of, the, part of it, it is nice. It doesn't have to be like perfectly uniform. Um, so it's it's stretchy, it's slightly sticky, which is fine. I added a little bit more flour to the outside of it. Um, so I'm hand shaping this. Um, some aunties can do this like super, I mean, or anyone working in a bakery can do this super fast. I, I've definitely got a lot better over the years, but I'm not at that level yet. <laughs> Maybe one day. <laughs> So you want it to be pretty even, I would say maybe a quarter of an inch thick. Um, it depends, it, it depends on, so the one thing is I like doughy bread, but um, because I'm not cooking it with ambient heat as much as I would in a tenor oven, you do have to make it a little thinner because you want to make sure that the dough is fully cooked. Um, but I will show you a trick to cook it a little further after it's been on the skillet. So let me rewind the camera. This can't be done on an electric oven, can it? Just like your gas oven? I definitely, I don't think so, unfortunately. You Sorry, can folks. Cook them, you can kind of cook them in the oven. Okay, so I'm spreading, I'm spreading the dough onto the skillet. And it should be hot enough, I heard a little sizzle. So it's already steaming, and the thinner parts are going to burn a little bit, and that's just part of the flavor. You don't grease or anything, so it, it theoretically. Well, so that's, that's a good question. I um, 
I don't because honestly, I think that's part of like in the same way that a cast iron sort of builds a somewhat non-stick uh, capacity, then um, uh, the, the, the carbon steel has a similar sort of, it has caked on, you know, non-stick capacity, but the heat of it will make it not stick so much. Um, so you'll start to see there's sort of bubbles forming. Um, it's about two minutes on each side. You asked me a question right before I put this on. Um, the size of the, the uh, any, any... I don't well, think we will come back to it. Okay, but in the meantime, I do have a question about how do you come to baking and learning and in embracing this uh, Iraqi food from your heritage? Um, sorry, hold on one second. Okay, thought we had a minute. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. I just want to, I want to make sure. So, um, baking. Yeah, I don't know. I guess baking seems to be a big, I mean, a big part of Iraqi food. Um, the pastries and the, the bread. I mean, wheat products in that region are, are just really central to the cuisine. And um, I, I wonder why baking in particular. I think, you know, it was, it was, um, I, you know, I think the reason that I'm really drawn to it is, you know, I love the maternal lineage of baking. Um, sorry, I'm just going to try to focus for a second. Okay. So um, once, you know, it's once you see those sort of bubbles and you might see browning on the thinner parts, you're going to flip it ah. over. Yeah, so that looks perfect. Um, so there's like slightly charred marks, but nothing too extreme. Um, and, you know, like I said, because this dough didn't, if I had let this rise overnight, maybe it would be even more bubbly. Like the longer you let it rise, it, it fills these really big bubbles. Like you might have seen that on certain kinds of non bread, um, but it's not essential to the to the bread. Um, but there were some bubbles and it's definitely like uh, has a nice light texture to it. So. So yeah, so this is a nice this is a nice look for the bottom. And then the, the other side doesn't take quite as long. Um, I'm wondering where I can show this to you. Um, hmm. At this process, I'll, nothing I'll is. Explain Go ahead. It. I'm probably not going to be able to show you on the same same screen, but um, basically, this is looking almost done. Yeah. So you see those. Um, so it sort of has um, where the bubbles have formed, it starts to get charred on the other side. So I have very little sensation in my fingers. Um, you might want to use tongs or something, um, but I haven't worked in restaurants, have, have mostly lost that <laughs> sensitivity. Um, but uh, a lot of, a, a lot lot of, of like, traditional bread makers, I used to work with a Sudani um, farmer and he would make Sudanese bread, which is essentially, it's kind of like a crepe type of pancake and they literally spread it on a hot pan with their palm. So it's pretty impressive. So anyway, this is our finished dough. And if you want it to cook, sort of steam out, because one thing is you don't want it to dry out. Um, I like to use like a big bowl or a big lid and I will, I will, so as let's say I'm making like five or six pieces, I'll just layer them under this and they will steam each other, and so they'll stay really moist. But the main thing with this bread is you want to make sure that it's staying moist as um, as it's as it's um, cooling down, um, because it is easy for it to dry out. And I can talk about that in a minute. Um, honestly, I might pause for a second, so I'm not like trying to. Usually, when I start making this, here, let me move this. You don't want them crisp. You want them moist. Um, so they're going to inherently be somewhat crispy. Hold on one second. Yeah, okay. Again, if you're taking notes, we'll post this soon. If you're getting hungry. <laughs> they're, they're inherently going to be somewhat crispy, um, um, especially if you're reheating them later. Um, I think the main challenge is trying to hold moisture in them, especially Actually, if you cook them to the point and they're thin enough that they're really getting crispy and charred at some points, that's going to dry it out. Um, and so I like the steaming method. They come out like almost moist. Um, and then um, that's, I mean, that's like a nice, I like that. You know, if you're going to eat it 
right off the skillet. You don't have to worry as much. It's just going to be really nice and warm. And that's really the way it's meant to be eaten. Um, but if you're going to wait a couple of hours, I definitely like steaming them out. I figured that figured out that that really helps it stay moist. And then what I usually do, if I'm not eating it that meal or very soon thereafter, is I let it cool down completely in that sort of steam situation. And then I put it in the freezer. Um, and frozen, I mean, this is true about all bread. If you have a really nice loaf, I got a really nice baguette the other day and um, I ate some and then I put the rest in the freezer and then it can go right from the freezer to the toaster oven or it can even just come up to room temperature from the freezer and that'll keep it as fresh. I mean, it tasted like it had just been made yesterday even though it had been in the freezer for a couple of weeks. Um, so that's a great thing. And the thing about these is they toast up super well whether, I mean, if it's really large, it'll be hard to fit, um, but you can fold it over and put it in a toaster oven or heat it up in your oven. And if it does dry out, if it really becomes like a cracker or, or like that, you can actually sprinkle water on it, like water it, um, and then toast it and it will soak up that moisture and become soft again. Um, and I think that works for multiple kinds. Like if you have really stale pita bread, um, you can do the same thing with that. Um, but I find, you know, pita bread, the way that we know it in the U.S., um, I think the reason that, I mean, it's good. I like pita bread, but I, I think that a lot of the kind times you get at grocery stores, unless people are lucky to know um, a bakery that makes pita bread, um, you know, it tastes kind of cardboardy or, you know, it's like very thin and sort of dry. And I think bread is just really, especially this kind of bread is meant to, um, I have two questions. Speaking of that, yeah. I have two questions. First, uh, I'll do the last one first, then you can segue back into the food, into the the the, the um, bread itself. Did you, when you were learning this, did you make it with family members, or you shared it with so, parents, grandparents? Yeah. So most, so this is actually an exception. Most of the recipes that I make are directly, you know, I never got a recipe. It was learned from you know, aunties, from my dad, from people in my family who were teaching it to me and had learned from their family members. The, the This bread, actually, no one that I know of in my family had made. They had just been buying local naan bread or that pizza that I told you about. It was something that they talked about, like, every time we ate, like, oh, I wish I had this bread that was from Baghdad, and it's, you know, so good, and we would just get it, and, and it made me want to make it so badly and so this is something that I kind of pulled out <laughs> like I did personal research on and you know YouTube is great especially if you you know there's a lot of content in English but especially if you can you know I'm not Arabic is not amazing but I can type a couple of words in Arabic and you know I don't need to be proficient in the language to understand what they're making um, and so I'm, I'm very grateful to YouTube for teaching me and um, having traveled to the region and seen people making this bread um, and, and just getting a lot of um, guidance from non bread, which is the much more common type of this bread in the area. But I know in New York, you guys are more privileged to have, um, I don't know if anyone has had bread like this. I know the um, Uzbeki region in Queens, the Uzbeki Jews have um, similar bread and, and half bakeries there is what I've heard. Um, that brings me to my next question, my first one. So when we go to the store, even more over a restaurant, Annabelle, what are we looking for for quality or um, really well-made? Thickness, toastiness, um, uh, moisture, uh, air or bubbles or, or the braising? Uh, what do we really want in a good one when we go to a restaurant or a store when it comes out? Um, a good piece of bread like this? Yeah, in this style. What makes it more authentic and, and gives it the quality that uh, we're looking at now? I mean, I, I know this is maybe not exactly what you're looking for, but I really think freshness and, um, okay. and like, you know, being, hmm, it's an interesting question. Freshness I mean, goes a long me, way. I'd, I'd accept that. Yeah. What? Freshness goes, freshness goes a long way. way. I, think I, that, I think we all accept that. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's, that's what stands out to me. Like when we have events and we serve fresh bread. I know my cousins have sort of um, begrudged me making this bread. It's very labor intensive. I've gotten into the rhythm of it, but it's very labor intensive. Some of the 
there's a similar, there's a bread in Iraq that's very similar to pita that, that has a pocket in it. Um, and that's incredibly labor intensive, but I think people really appreciate the freshness. Um, and that's something when you go to a restaurant that you, that you don't often get um, is fresh bread, maybe occasionally at a French or Italian restaurant, but I think a lot of um, this style of food often doesn't have I could have cooked that a little longer, actually. Um, but I think you can tell when bread is fresh. It's softer and it has flavor to it. I think that a lot of bread, as it gets older, you know, it loses its inner moisture. And that's sort of why I'm so focused on the steaming in this, in this um, under a lid or of sorts, is that I think moisture is a big factor. You know, um, there's a, a, actually a, there's um, pita, the more traditional, I think people are familiar with the pita pocket. Um, there's a yeah. bakery in um, Southern Massachusetts, South, Southeastern Massachusetts. And it's just, you know, it's the same bread that you would get at a grocery store, but it's so much fresher and you can really tell the difference. Um, so it's a real treat. But at the end of the day, I mean, I've, I, I was lucky to go to Jordan a couple of years ago and um, they have a really large Iraqi diaspora there. And so there's an entire neighborhood that's all Iraqi restaurants. And so that was the most, that was the closest, I've never been to Iraq, but that was the closest I, I got to sort of see the operation. And it's really, it's a sight to behold. They're just like going, and there's actually, um, there's like, and I think this is typical, there's, there's restaurants that have, ooh, ouch. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, tongs are good, but I'm, I'm a little stubborn. Um, so there's restaurants that have some guy and a tenor oven, like in a little room right next to where um, you are seated. And he's just making bread so that you can have the fresh, freshest bread possible while you're eating your food. Um, and you sort of, you can have a lot of it. So, so that's really special. It's definitely like can be, um, a bit of a balancing act if you want your bread to be as fresh as possible. Let's say you're making a dinner, like how do you time it? But I definitely try to make the bread last, ideally. But the the retoasting is great. Like if you freeze it and retoast it, it can really taste super. That's good. what I was going to get to about freezing and, and maintenance. But is this also considered in other cultures uh, or Egyptian culture lafa? Also, is that the I same thing you're making? Oh, hold on one second. Okay. That's a can. We're coming live from Massachusetts, folks. <laughs> um, so here's the bread. It's have you know it's a little cooler, so I can hold it. Very um, flexible. It's, so it's nice very, very it's fine. Nice fine. You know, it's not too dry, um, but it has some crispy bits on it. So that's the nice. I like that balance. Um, so lafa. I don't know. I actually, honestly, I don't know much about lafa. I know that um, in Egypt. Um, the um, bread is called Ayish, which is um, the word for life. So if that highlights how much bread is important, important, I don't know what else could highlight that more. It's very similar to this bread. It's a little bit more um, whole wheat. Um, and it has like some kind of cornmeal or maybe bulgur on the outside of it. Um, but it's similarly like a uh, large uh, flat bread like this, not like the pita that you see more, uh, more commonly in like Northern, Northern um, Arab countries um, that has the pocket inside of it. Um, and yeah, this kind of bread is very popular in Iran as well. Um, yeah, I don't know that much about lafa. I don't know. About okay. um, yeah, that's, that's it. Oh, so oh. I guess I should say um, this bread, you know, like I said, it's used as a vehicle often for eating things. So let's say you had a stew um, or, you know, some tomato eggplant dish, um, then you can use it to sort of like sop up the juices and, and grab food. But I, I mean, as an American and much more um, geared towards that style of eating, I'm, I'm much, I, I'm very attached to this bread as um, delicious sandwich bread. And so I will typically um, put some kind of sandwich filler in this. So either um, kebabs, like ground meat kebabs that you can have in a sandwich, or a really great addition is, um, which I'm probably going to make tonight because there's fresh eggplant in season, um, is going to cook some eggplant in oil and, and have some pickles and maybe some fresh herbs. 
um, and make a nice sandwich. So um, that's a really great way of using the bread or Some, you know, with your eggs in the morning. It's, it's so delicious. Somebody just wrote in about adding, um, she's seeing cream cheese, diced onion, sliced tomato and lox on this bread right now. So her, her taste buds are working. And also uh, others have said about tahini and lemon and other things. Yeah, tahini, tahini and um, eggplant is a very common sandwich. Um, actually, um, I was talking to an Iraqi, not to an Iraqi about this, but sabih, if anyone knows the, this popular dish in, in Israel, actually is from Iraqi Jews. Um, and it's a very typical like eggs, eggplant um, and, and, uh, and bread. Um, which is sort of the basis of that dish. And amba, which is an incredibly important Iraqi um, condiment, is this like super classic sandwich. And so that's really the roots of, of that dish, which has sort of evolved in diaspora. Um, but so okay. that's a great way to eat this bread for sure. Um, and the salmon, the lox um, definitely sounds so like my mom's side is actually Ashkenazi, Russian, Jewish. So that sounds like a perfect fusion dish that might encompass. Um, Nobody goes hungry. <laughs> yeah. I have everyone. a couple last minute questions. Everyone happy, but also who doesn't love smoked salmon? So. Sure, that's happy. A couple of wrap up questions before we go to uh, our our, audio, our uh, members and congregation. Um, you mentioned you're an urban um, urban um, farmer. Can you something about that? And what is the diaspora uh, population of Iraqi Jews in America? If you know of it, know that at all. That's a good question. I actually have no idea. Okay, um, we'll have our experts I should, work I on think that. I about my statistics. I'm more of a storyteller than a statistic. We got our crack staff working on it as we speak. Oh, great. Oh, good. Yeah. But what's your so, urban oh, farming? Wikipedia away. Wikipedia. Um, what's your urban farming? And then we're going to get set up for questions from our uh, listeners and viewers. So, um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> how did I end up farming? I don't even, I guess I cared a lot about the outdoors and the environment. And I also, you know, I had a background in nutrition and I cared a lot about food. And I mean, the reality is I, you know, I worked, I started working on farms when I was in high school and then worked on a farm after graduating um, and then uh, from university. And then I sort of got hooked on it <laughs> for better. That for sounds like a good um, story as any. Yeah. Okay. And then, you know, I've had like so many joyful experiences with it and that, you know, I'm especially grateful um, this year to be able to be doing, I mean, like so much about the world is so different, um, but there's a real constant and growing food. Um, and I feel like a heightened appreciation of it. And so I work, you know, I, I do a lot of education around getting people more aware of like how to tend to plants and different diseases and pests and stuff like that. And it's real, it's been really rewarding to, you know, there's been a lot more interest in that recently. And I think it's just such a great way to connect to what you eat, even if you don't grow everything you eat. I think it can be more of a, you know, a spiritual practice, really. Um, and um, recently, I've been more interested in sort of merging a and the, the, the growing food elements of my life. And so I've been trying to grow more specialty, um, Iraqi specialty crops. So I'm growing some specialty cucumbers. Cucumbers are an incredibly important part of Iraqi food and that region, um, and um, and watermelon. There's a special kind of watermelon, um, and so I'm interested in doing more of that because actually a lot of the heirloom seeds in Iraq. There was when the U.S. was there, um, you know. I think there was, you know, tactics used to you know limit the amount of. There was more push for sort of Monsanto type seeds to be used, and so there was a lot of erasure of heirloom um, crops in that region. So it's a really important thing to preserve. Um, I think, you know, Iraq's had a really hard time for the past couple of decades. And so a lot of culture, it's it's hard. You know, there hasn't been as much resource or, or energy or ability to be preserving that. So, um, Well, and the yeah. good news though, Annabelle, we just have uh, information which everyone sees, but I'll share it with you. And then we'll go to our first question. It's estimated the total Iraqi Jewish population in the U.S. exceeds 15,000 people with large concentrations, California, New York, Connecticut, Florida, drum roll please for your state, Massachusetts, Massachusetts. and it's New Jersey, and a... New Jersey. Okay, That's thank fun. you very much, Annabelle. I think it's time for a few questions because uh, right. everyone's getting on, I think we'll get round of applause, <laughs> vir virtually or the sound effect, whatever we could use. And there we go. All right, now Ray, how would you